Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see a good crowd on this glorious day, and I heard there's ice cream around the corner. I'm not going to tell you where, so you don't go running off to get the free ice cream from Ben and Jerry's, but it's really uh, important, I think, to be here. This is where the action is, uh, because we're really all in this together, um, not just trying to find ways to make the University of Michigan carbon neutral as fast as we can. We just got our first wind per big wind purchase announced today. That's great news. Um, but finding ways for, to help society, other universities, our community we live in, the state of Michigan, the nation, go carbon neutral much faster than anybody's really been thinking. It's our job to make that happen and to find ways to do it as a community, not just on this campus, but far and wide. I'm Jonathan Overpeck, and I'm the Dean of the School for Environment and Sustainability, and I am a member of the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality, and I'm joined here today to help uh, moderate this session with President Slissel uh, by two other members of the Commission. The first one is uh, Logan Veer, who is an undergraduate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And she's also a, a researcher in our Energy Institute. And sitting next to her, yay. And sitting next to her is another member of our commission, a graduate student in uh, the Department of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering, Austin Glass. Welcome. I'd also like to highlight in the row, pretty much up front, our other members of the commission. I think we're all very interested in what's going to be uh, said today and shared today, both by the, the community and by uh, the president. Um, and I especially want to note that the two uh, co-chairs of the president's commission are here, Jennifer Haverkamp and Steve Forrest. So thank you for joining us. So just a real brief overview of what's going to happen next. You're going to hear from Austin and Logan about the intent of this uh, event and also some ground rules to make sure that we get as much heard as possible and as much sharing of uh, information and questions. Uh, then the president is going to offer some very brief remarks. And then we're going to take uh, questions from the audience. We'll have two microphones, one on each aisle. Uh, plus, there'll be people in the room who probably don't want to stand up who can submit cards, and the cards can be um, brought to the front, and Logan and Austin will look at those cards and um, try and um, get them into the mix. As you'll see, we're going to try, try and be very efficient. So in that uh, hope, I will uh, shut up, but I just want to say also that everything here is going to be recorded and put online so our colleagues who are not here have the opportunity to hear uh, what transpired here today. So again, thank you so much for coming, and I hope we have a, uh, a very interesting hour or so of question and answers and discussion. Thank you. So I think, Austin? Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I want to try and be cognizant of your time. I just have one side of a page worth of some zoomed out remarks. Um, thank you all for being here. I uh, wanted to take just my few moments at the front uh, to briefly talk about community and some ongoing discussions on some aspects of carbon neutrality at the university. Uh, today's session is the continuation of a very important conversation across the university about working together to put us on a trajectory toward carbon neutrality. Uh, I'm glad to have you all here with us today to participate in this conversation. I want to quickly recap the community collaboration the university has already participated in on this topic. Um, I don't do so as an attempt to alleviate a concern I know is out there amongst folks uh, that the university is doing enough, isn't doing enough to build community and communicate effectively its goals uh, and decisions on aspects of these issues. I don't want to assuage that concern because in part I share it. Um, I'm going to do so only to give you some context to where we are now. Uh, the President's Commission has hosted two town halls where more than 150 community members shared our ideas with one another in small groups and were able to ask questions to the Commission co-chairs. Uh, we're in the process of cataloging all those ideas and they'll all be available to the Commission as key inputs in forming our work through this process. 
We've received comments online from over 100 community members through the online portal linked behind me, I think. Yes? Yes. At the bottom. Um, every single comment submitted to that link will similarly be read and cataloged um, and fed back into the commission to inform our work in understanding the state of the issue on campus and in our practical suggestions eventually for how the university can achieve carbon neutrality. We're in the process of forming four advisory panels, students, faculty, university units, and external experts, uh, which will be key sources of input and perspectives throughout this process. For Maya and Logan's part, the student advisory panel has been formed already and consists of students from a variety of campus areas, including housing, food services, transportation, business, media, and arts, architecture and urban planning, environmental law, public policy, and social work, among others, and soon including representation from the Flint and Dearborn campuses. We're looking forward to the continued important perspectives that the student advisory panel will provide to the commission and the president. Uh, I'm grateful for the platform here today uh, to say that I enthusiastically believe that the university must do more than it has done so far to ensure effective communication with the community and especially with students. Without understanding the perspective of students fully, we in the commission can't hope to achieve a fraction of that with which we are charged. I know that there is a sense of frustration in the student body at large on communications and at progress on this issue because I see it and hear it in the work that I do and because I share it. Please know that I believe, and I suspect the others up here agree with me, that your informed opinions are and ought to drive our work, and that your ideas and experiences are and continue to be a valued part of our work on the commission. I'm encouraged by the president's willingness to hold this event and take your questions, and in so doing, come a step closer to making good on the trust that we as the students, and indeed as a generation, must place in the hands of this university and other entities like it to responsibly and rapidly address the part we play in this global challenge and crisis. I'll continue to push as we move forward for more and different types of communication like this between the community and administration, and I look forward to this event tonight as a chance for you all to ob obtain some deserved clarification and insight into the early stages of our process. Thank you for your time, thanks for being here. Logan's gonna talk about some ground rules. Hi everyone, uh, thank you again so much for coming. We're really looking forward to hearing and reading all of your questions. Before we jump right in though, as Austin just said, um, I'm going to walk us through a few general guidelines to ensure that the question and answer um, part of this session is equitable, effective, and efficient. So please keep these in mind for the remainder of the hour. First, the purpose of the, today's event is to give community members, especially students, the opportunity to be heard and ask questions or raise issues that they want the president to address. In doing so, we simply ask that everyone practice respecting, respective listening and speaking behaviors. Second, we want to maximize the opportunity for everyone to be able to speak if they choose to do so. Therefore, we respect that you or we request that you only ask one question. Um, there can be a short comment if needed, but please keep it as brief as possible and on the topic of climate change and or carbon neutrality. If questions start to get too long, we may intervene to make sure that we are moving things along. Third, it is likely that many of you have similar questions or similar topics um, that you all would like the president to address. In the event that things become slightly repetitive, we may um, just try to move us on to the next question in order to minimize the redundancy within the questions. Similarly, uh, we will be trying to highlight the questions and comments coming in on the cards, um, which have not already been spoken to. Fourth, if we can not get to your question or issue today, there are other ways which you can register your point of view or share comments. The URL, which is on the title slide behind us, um, and can also be easily found on the Planet Blue website, links directly to the online commenting submission form for the commission. Um, so if you have any ideas, thoughts, or anything during this or after today's event, you can share them there. Um, also, please just use this at any point throughout our time uh, up until the, the carbon neutrality report is um, released. So that's ongoing. Um, additionally, the comments and questions on the cards today, um, even if they are not able to be read completely, um, they will be shared with the commission and reviewed later. Lastly, our goal is to continue to look forward um, for additional ways which we can use uh, th these types of platforms and others to expand information sharing among all of in our community. So we truly encourage you to continue or to start using these means of communication um, as we all work toward, towards this carbon neutrality effort. On that note, I would like to introduce President, President Schlissel to give a few opening remarks. So th thanks, Logan, and thanks, um, uh, Austin, for 
uh, coming, helping moderate, and of course, uh, Dean Overpeck, uh, uh, thanks to the members of the commission, uh, but particularly thanks to all of you in the audience who've come here today, and uh, particularly our students, and I've been hearing from students and faculty, so I really welcome the opportunity to hear from you directly uh, to tell you a little bit about what I'm thinking and to get your advice as we move forward. Uh, I can certainly say that the um, advocacy significantly by our students around the effects of greenhouse gases on global climate change is coming through loud and clear. Uh, and I want to spend this hour really listening to you and hearing directly from you uh, how you're thinking about this and what you suggest uh, we do and why and how. Um, I do not pretend to be an expert in uh, climate change, in global warming and greenhouse gases. Um, I'm a biologist and a medical doctor and I'm responsible for making the best decisions I can on behalf of our community. And when I don't have expertise, I rely on people uh, that really do. So uh, I really welcome uh, everybody's input. Um, this won't be our only opportunity, won't be our last opportunity. This is a recent opportunity, but um, you know, I have office hours, I do fireside chats with students, I have students to my home for, for breakfast, for pizza dinners. So uh, this is an ongoing conversation on an enormously important topic. Um, I share your commitment to proceed as quickly as possible and get us to carbon neutrality. Um, particularly to the students, it's really, I recognize that it is your generation that will bear more of the brunt and have more of an effect on your own lives and on your family's lives than mine. I'm 61 years old. Um, but I do have four children that are much closer to your generation, and now I have a granddaughter. Uh, so this is um, similarly personal, I think, for all of us. Um, when I first got here back in 2014, my predecessor, Mary Sue Coleman, uh, had made a commitment a couple years earlier, as, as you all know, to work towards diminishing our uh, greenhouse gas release, our CO2 release, by 25% above a 2006 baseline by the year 2025. Uh, we had made a little bit of progress on that, but not a whole lot and I needed help and advice. So we put together uh, a greenhouse, uh, a number of groups to work on sustainability issues and advise me, including a, a greenhouse gas group uh, who made a number of recommendations. Um, we've made some progress and uh, the uh, gratifying thing actually is now with the uh, work we've done about how we build on the campus and conserve energy around the campus, some demonstration projects, um, a gas turbine that I'm sure we're going to talk more about, and uh, today's announcement of a contract we just entered into with DTE to buy brand new windmill energy made here in the state of Michigan, uh, by 2021 we'll hit our 25% goal. Now obviously that's not enough, and the time now is to figure out what's next. So we've been able to figure out how to hit the 2025 goal early, the challenge that I think we all share is how to move towards and ultimately get to sustainability, which is carbon neutrality. Um, so what's next? Well, you know, since I am not an expert, we set up a group of people who are. Uh, Dean Overpeck is amongst them, but many of the commission members are sitting here. Uh, they're all people that have expertise and come at this problem from a variety uh, of different directions. The committee was charged to engage very widely to capture as much of the collective wisdom and passion of our community as possible and to come up with recommendations that are applicable not just for us but for the community around us and other communities like us. It's the sad fact is even if we can go carbon neutral as a campus, if it's only us, if it's not Ann Arbor or Southeast Michigan or the state of Michigan or the nation, um, sadly we're not big enough to make more than a symbolic difference. We have to do it in a way that's consistent with our mission of research and teaching and patient care. We have to do it in a way that's just and equitable. We have to make the right trade-offs. Uh, everything we do is gonna require resources that we have to invest, and there's only so many resources, and our job is to balance them. This is an extremely important goal, uh, but we have many important goals on campus, and we have to get the balance right, and that's why I need input. I can't just sit in my office and decide for everybody what the right balance of activity is. Um, but I also want to point out it's important to me that we all recognize that both collectively as a university 
And as individuals, we actually share responsibility for this success. Uh, as we use the campus, the way we behave on the campus has an impact on how much energy we use and whether the buildings we build hit the performance levels we're after and, and things of that nature. So we really do as individuals share, um, not just in the need to have a successful outcome, but in actually in driving that success. So I remain committed to achieve neutrality as soon as possible. I remain open to good new ideas all the time. There isn't a, a magic moment where I'm not gonna listen in, until two years go by. I'm interested in good ideas today that are practical that can be implemented. Uh, and I really do appreciate your advocacy and your partnership. Advocacy really does make a difference. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn things uh, back over to Logan uh, and to Peck and Austin to help uh, moderate. Uh, and I'm happy to hear your thoughts and answer the questions you might have uh, as best I can. So. Thanks very much, Mark. So we have two microphones here. Um, there will also be people uh, looking for cards who are holding them up here. If you want to write a comment instead of standing up and talking to the whole group, we can. Uh, you'll get your you'll get your comment into the or question into the mix pretty quick that way too, perhaps. So why don't we start over on this side and then we'll go over here and then we'll do a card as soon as we have one. Shall we have folks introduce themselves or? Yeah, why don't you say who you are? Um, and uh, but we want again remember Logan's ground rules. Keep things as brief as you can so we can get as many people involved as possible, please. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you all. Uh, sir, ma'am, and whatever in between, sorry. Uh, uh, my name is Andrew Laporte, and I am currently a freshman undergrad, well, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Michigan in the uh, uh, RC. And my question is, is that recently East Quad has undergone extensive renovations and Ross School of Business is, as far as I recall, undergoing extensive renovations using school, to, using school, using school tuition. Now, I'm curious as to whether these, uh, these uh, renovations were made with uh, renewability or sustainability in mind. And if they weren't, uh, how feasible or unfeasible would it be to uh, alter those reno coming reservation renovations so that it would be renewable? So a good and important question. So I'm not familiar with the details of those two particular renovation projects. I wasn't even aware that Ross is being renovated yet again, uh, because it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but all of our construction and all of our renovation projects are done with uh, sustainability um, in mind, uh, with uh, diminishing the amount of energy utilization, increasing efficiency in mind. And one of the things I hope the commission does is talk about what the right standards are. Um, and um, you know, th there are a lot of open questions. Is it just the use of energy in a building? Is it the materials that we use in the building and the supply chain for those materials? Uh, so there are a lot of important questions we need to address. Uh, I don't think we can be successful without incorporating um, uh, greenhouse gas or carbon neutrality thinking into both construction and renovation projects. It's very challenging too because our campus has grown by 20% since that 2006 baseline year. Uh, we have beautiful facilities that contribute to our mission, uh, but they also impose a challenge of building these things in ways that are as parsimonious around energy as possible. Thanks. Now on this side, please. Hi, my name is Jonathan Morris. I think you know me. Um, I'm a PhD student at School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, the recent science on fugitive methane leaks from natural gas infrastructure shows clearly that natural gas is not a legitimate bridge fuel and does not meaningfully contribute to carbon or to greenhouse gas reduction. Given that you and the Office for Campus Sustainability have repeatedly been made aware of this science and that I have personally sent you links to these studies, some of which include University of Michigan professors, when will the university move past the narrow scopes of carbon emissions taken thus far to properly account for the true emissions of the central power plant and stop making claims that ignore the latest science? Yeah, so. I uh, owe you a debt of thanks for actually bringing these articles to me, because as I said, as a non-expert, you got me. And this was a recommendation, actually, of the last group of faculty and students uh, for how to move forward. 
I think it is important to account honestly for the contributions that this uh, new combined heat and power turbine make to our efforts around uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, so the situation we're in uh, is we remain dependent uh, for the at least the short to intermediate term on fossil fuels to make the steam that's necessary to heat our campus. In the short term, the best thinking and the people I've spoken to, and uh, I'd love experts to tell me it's different, um, uh, we require the ability to make steam and it's fossil fuels needed to make that steam. So one way or another we need to make the steam. We need electricity to run the campus. We need it for the health system, you know, we need it for our research labs, uh, we need it for our, our dorms and our classrooms. Uh, the electricity that we buy from our utilities uh, comes from a mix of sources, but right now that mix is about 60% coal. So what I would understand is this turbine, which creates both steam uh, and produces electricity, is twice as efficient right now in terms of the amount of energy we get per volume of uh, gas in this instance uh, than our existing uh, ability to do either one of those things separately from one another. Uh, the data you point out really looks striking and perhaps even compelling, and I think it's beholden upon us to examine the supply chain for the gas that we're using and buying for our power plant, not just the new turbine, but all the gas that we're using, uh, understand that supply chain and how much leakage there is, uh, initially account for that leakage as we do our calculations, but then work with the suppliers where I imagine it's also in their best interest to minimize leakage, not just for environmental reasons, but their product is leaking away. So you raise a valid and important point. We've paid for the turbine. It's being installed. We need the electricity, we need the steam. In effect, we're getting the electricity almost for free because we need the steam and you can make electricity at the same time. But I am committed to following up on your, your, suge your not your suggestions, but the data you brought forward and the, the science. Uh, I'll ask the commission to look at this and say, look, for our power plant and our suppliers, uh, what is the net um, influence of the source of gas we're using? Uh, and I think ultimately, uh, we have to get away from all fossil fuels. It's just in the 10 year time horizon, uh, it's very difficult and no one's brought forward a way for us to completely get away from fossil fuels. So will the university recalculate the emissions reduction numbers based on the methane science? Yeah, I need help. But the methane science, you know, that's a paper. You know, we have a specific supply chain for our methane. And you know, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we could provoke suppliers to compete for how unleaky their supply chains are. And if we call them out and say, look, we're not gonna buy from you, but we're gonna buy from you because your leakage rate is X percent and yours is 0.7 times X, maybe we can drive change. And we're also not the only organization that uh, is a little bit dependent or is dependent on the transition period of using gas. So we have to clean up gas as we work on finding other ways to make steam or convert away from steam. But thank you. Thanks for bringing those papers, too. Thanks. So now we're going to do one of the comment questions real quick. Um, so what entity should be responsible and accountable for tracking and reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to U of M travel? For example, commuting, U of M paid flights, um, patient and spectator visits, uh, U of M, the city of Ann Arbor, individuals. Why doesn't U of M include this in the tracking today? Yeah, I think it's you know, really good questions, and I would welcome the Commission's advice on the answer. So uh, I'd want to think hard about it, and you know, if we broaden the scope of how we're thinking about our carbon footprint, um, you really have to include everything that moves, and you know, that includes all of us, and those of us to commute, you know, I get to walk to work, so uh, I am carbon neutral in my commute, uh, but those of us that have to drive or take mass transit, I'm not carbon neutral when I fly around the country representing the university or when our basketball team goes to play in the Final Four in Texas, they're not carbon neutral. So we have to figure out what to count, how to count it, and then a bookkeeping process, and then ways to move towards accounting for that carbon release. You know, one of the things that's really exciting here is we have a research program going on uh, in, uh, called Beyond Carbon Neutral. It, it's on modes of sequestering carbon. So if there are uh, current 
needs to generate energy by burning fossil fuels, and we can't get away from that, at least in the short term, perhaps we can develop ways to recapture carbon from the atmosphere, convert it into forms in which it's not a greenhouse gas, and thus get into equilibrium. So I think you know, that's something that the, this university is actually working on, as are other uh, um, uh, scholars and companies around the country. But uh, in the short answer to the question is, I think we should figure out how to, what to account for and how to account for it, and then include it in our goals. All right, uh, we're back on this line here, please. Thank you. My name is Catherine Badgley. I'm a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Residential College. This morning, a letter with more than 300 signatures from U of M faculty arrived in your office, and I'm one of the originators of that letter. Uh, the, <laughs> that, letter that letter urged you to reconsider the planned expansion of the central power plant, which you've just discussed, and divestment of holdings and fossil fuel securities from our investment portfolio in order to show substantial leadership in carbon neutrality. It also urged you to withdraw the trespass citations given to the students and community members who were arrested in your office on March 15th. So well, hang on for one. I didn't catch the very last one you said, because I read your letter, but briefly, because it just yes, arrived today. But the last one you just mentioned about some kind of pass certification. I, right. Sorry, I said withdraw the trespass citations oh, I'm sorry, trespass. given gotcha. to the students and community members yep. who are arrested. What is your response to the faculty members who signed this letter? Sure, so first of all, you know, thank you for the faculty for getting organized, organizing your thoughts. And a big shout out to the students because what the faculty asked for is actually... In support of the students. It's almost directly, almost word for word. So you know, shout out to the students who are leading the way and thanks for the faculty for supporting them as well. Um, so uh, the, the issue around the trespass and the sitting, sitting in and that led to some uh, arrests. Uh, the people who were arrested haven't been charged yet and that is sitting right now with the prosecutor of Washtenaw County. Um, we have rules and practices around the campus putting boundaries around protest. And when it comes to sitting in office buildings that are closed, including my office, you, know, you can sit there all day while it's open. Well, many of you did for weeks. The last few weeks I had many visitors to the office. Um, when the building's closed, you have to go home and it's safety, it's security. Uh, we spent several hours, I, I was actually not in the office that day, but my colleagues spent several hours discussing this with the folks who were sitting in, and most people decided, you know, they've been there all day, they've made their point, they'll come back again on Monday, uh, but they'd prefer not to be, you know, taken out and arrested. And 10, 10 or 12 uh, um, people were, they weren't, all, they weren't all our students, but 10 or 12 people were. I think it's unfortunate, but at the end of the day, I can't allow people to camp out in buildings that are closed. So um, it's just a, a, a practice. And as you can imagine, you know, with 45,000 students on campus and thousands of faculty and many people that are passionate about many issues, uh, it's significantly a practical thing too. We have to draw a line on building access and almost everybody sort of gets it and we have to strike the right balance because the advocacy the student's doing is important. Uh, we want to hear it, but then when the buildings close, we also want people to be able to go home. Uh, and remind me of the first part of your, your... Well, we'd also like to hear your... You've already explained some of your views about the planned expansion of the central power plant. Yeah. What about the issue of divestment? Oh, yes. So, so you know, essentially, um, uh, we don't divest. And it's not this cause, it's essentially all causes. The endowment is responsible for a significant fraction of our financial aid budget. It, it may or may not pay your salary, but it pays many faculty salaries. It pays for biomedical research. Um, we get more payout from the endowment now each year than we get in our money from the state of Michigan. So it's really critical for us as a robust university. Uh, and what we do when we take a gift to the endowment is we make a commitment to the person giving the gift that will use investment principles, um, uh, risk and, and return, to try to get a long-term stable return so we can support what we made a commitment to. Uh, if we begin the process of narrowing what the endowment can invest in, uh, based on very valid arguments and concerns from sincere people, uh, the ability to invest shrinks and the value of the endowment goes down and the institution uh, suffers. 
Uh, so um, we're just not going to divest. And you know, I can't prevent someone from talking about it and from advocating, of course. Uh, but um, we haven't for any issue in quite some time. Uh, and I, I, myself and, and the board don't have an intention uh, to divest, not just on this issue, but on the panoply, half a dozen other issues that requests have been made. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, your name and question, please. Hi, my name is Rosalind. I'm a, a freshman in LSNA. Many universities the size of U of M are well on their way to 100% renewable energy. Stanford University will be 100% solar by 2021. OSU is 25% wind powered. And the cities of Aspen, Colorado and Georgetown, Texas are almost entirely, um, entirely powered by wind, solar and hydroelectricity. Additionally, multiple studies have demonstrated that wind, solar, hydroelectric, hydroelectric, and geothermal power are all cheaper than coal or natural gas. You were quoted in an article in the University Record two weeks ago saying that in the near term, there is no viable alternative to fossil fuels at a scale that would not threaten our ability to operate a major research university and regional medical center. Can you explain, given the progress made by institutions of comparable scale and resources, why you think that there's no viable alternative to fossil fuels for the University of Michigan. So, you know, multiple answers. Every university is different than every other. And every university, as they advertise their efforts in accounting for greenhouse gases, uh, uses a different set of definitions. So we count everything. We have a very large health system. We've got you know, uh, thousands of, uh, of residence hall beds. Uh, we have steam, as I mentioned earlier, as the source of heating. Um, and uh, the situation isn't the same here as it is in California. It isn't as sunny as, as much, and there isn't as much hydro here. <laughs> well, no, it's true. And the wind doesn't blow all the time, so. Uh, well, I, I can do this best if I can try my very best to answer your questions and try to stay focused on the questioner. Uh, please, uh, uh, so uh, I'm committed to get us to neutrality. I'm asking this group to help us figure out how to do it and do it as quickly as possible. Um, an example is brought up pretty often of Ohio State University, you know, just down the road sort of, uh, who is getting a lot of credibility in this community a little surprisingly. Uh, I don't think they're ahead of us in their efforts around carbon neutrality. I think you have to look carefully at the data. Uh, I think that there's a question of each institution coming from a different place, uh, being of a different scale, and counting different things. So in the case of OSU, uh, they've made great efforts, and I want them to succeed. So we're all breathing the same air. We're all sharing the same earth. So I, have, uh, I want everyone to succeed at this. Uh, but in their instance, um, you know, they basically just got coal out of their power plant pretty recently, about 15 years ago. We got rid of coal 40 years ago. So we're coming from different places. Now, we're going to have to recalculate everything based on this data that we've been talking about. Uh, but for example, our uh, energy use per square foot is two-thirds that of Ohio State University today. So we're, we're not anywhere near where we need to be. But I think we have to be really careful, you know, expressing inadequacy as we look at others. And we have to work together, coming up with the best ideas in the quickest way to make the investments we need to become carbon neutral at the University of Michigan, and to do it in a way that the surrounding area, other schools, our state can follow us to. Yeah, I'll ask a question from a card. Uh, card says, in what ways is the commission considering energy and environmental justice implications in the development and implementation of the plan toward carbon neutrality? Yeah, yeah, I think we need to be, we hold ourselves to account and we need our community to hold us to account to um, put a filter of justice and equity on everything that we do, in, including our efforts around sustainability and greenhouse gases. I think one of the hardest things that the commission's gonna have to grapple with is the opportunity cost of investments in greenhouse gas reduction. Um, it is, is not true, because I know because I just signed a contract, the cost of that windmill energy is not identical to the cost uh, today in Michigan for us of uh, com average commercial electricity. 
and the investments we're going to have to make, for example, to get away from steam or come up with an alternative to steam are very large investments. Where does the money come from? Well, it comes from the same place that the money comes from to do our research and our teaching and to maintain our buildings. So we're going to need to make choices as a community, and that's why it was very important to me, rather than say, I'm going to become carbon neutral by a certain day, rather to say, look, we need to come together as a community and identify what the trade-offs are. So, for example, if I had to sacrifice the Go Blue Guarantee to hit a 2030 target instead of a 2035 target or a 2028 target, I want advice about that. I don't want to make that decision because I'm trading off a person's ability to have access to higher ed for our ability to save the planet. That's a terrible trade-off for, for me to have to sit there and be the person who makes. And I think the, that's a big part of the justice and equity component is we need to figure out how to spend our resources in a way that maintains our robustness as a great academic institution that continues to offer access and opportunity to people from all different parts of our society, an area where I think we're still challenged, uh, and makes the investments we need to stay amongst the top universities of the world and protect our planet all at the same time with the same set of resources, and that's where I need advice. Please introduce yourself. And uh, my name is Lena Swerczak. I'm a freshman in LSA. Um, I'm here because the university claims to value community input, but the administration has refused to engage in substantive dialogue with us on multiple occasions. We've published open letters of recommendations in multiple op-eds, we've made requests at regents meetings, and we've spoken with you during your office hours. In these conventional routes of communication, we have been rebuffed, told we should focus on getting people to turn off light bulbs, or lobby the state or federal government. The message being that the responsibility and power clearly lies anywhere but the university. When student efforts culminate in a peaceful protest in your office, we ultimately ask for a continuation of the conversation in a public forum where our concerns could not be quietly dismissed. Why did you refuse to engage with us that evening of March 15th and, set, and uh, instead allow 10 of us to be arrested? We were simply asking for the conversation we're having today. You know, here we are, we're having the conversation today, and you and I have spoken before, and I'm sure we'll get to speak again. I don't accept the premise that I'm not available for people to discuss things and people give me the ideas. Uh, I'm not always available on demand, and that's a tough thing when you're responsible for a large, complicated place where there's no issue more important than the issue we're talking about today, but there are other issues that to many of us in the community are as important to them as individuals. So setting up a, a hierarchy where what you need to do is come to my office and refuse to leave and demand to talk to me and I'll come and talk to you is a very difficult way to run the campus. Uh, what I can do is set things like we're doing today where it's absolutely clear that the community does want and need to have input and I want and need help and that's why we're here. Uh, so um, if we can develop, uh, um, give each other some slack, uh, grant each other the um, benefit of the doubt that there's goodwill involved here and that we want the same thing in the end and what we're struggling with is how to get there, uh, then I think it's easier to work together and you know, I hope to have more forums like this uh, which are much more effective than um, uh, uh, coming into the office and, and reading a list of demands. Then how do you say that you support student advocacy? Because I'm standing up here in front of you, listening to you and responding respectfully as, a, as a, 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 almost a colleague in that we share responsibility for the future of the planet and we have responsibility for how we run the campus. It's your responsibility. We don't have I beg you, uh, you can Strike get in line. I, but, I yeah. stand inside. I just, I'm here. worried about a whole bunch of individual comments bursting out. We won't get through a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. And we ask that you commit to having this, not to, we, did, we understand that you're very busy and you can't run down to the office at any given moment, but all we were asking was for a commitment. Good. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do it again. Yeah. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Olivia Perfetti. We actually just had an email exchange this morning. Yep, you wrote me today. Um, and before I ask my question, I just wanted to respond to a few of the things you've said so far. Um, so first of all, in regards to the arrests, you're correct that um, so far no charges have been carried out, but some students were banned from the Fleming building for a year, 
and others were banned from all of campus for a year. So I think that's mm. what the faculty letter was addressing. Uh, you also stated that you can't, quote, prevent anyone from talking about divestment, which is clearly not true because you explicitly have directed the commission not to discuss divestment. Um, so now on to my question, which I hope you'll address in addition to those things. Um, my question is about how the administration will be held accountable for following the recommendations of the Commission on Carbon Neutrality. So the previous, now disbanded, Greenhouse Gas Committee made many recommendations, which included purchasing local landfill gas, installing solar panels above parking lots, powering North Campus with geothermal energy, improving building standards, implementing an internal carbon tax, implementing procedures for purchase of energy-saving equipment, and developing a plan to address scope three emissions. Most of these recommendations including simple ones such as improved building standards, were not implemented. I'm concerned that the recommendations of the Commission on Carbon Neutrality will also be ignored because there is no mechanism in place requiring the administration to follow them. Can you commit right now to ensuring that this new Commission's recommendations will be followed and not ignored or put off for many years? And if so, what substantive structural or procedural changes will you make to show us that you remain accountable? So I'm gonna have a very hard time answering because I'm having a hard time remembering the first six parts, but I'll get to the, towards the end parts. Um, so accountability, uh, the last round of recommendations, the top several actually have been implemented and that's how we're getting to 25%. Uh, the others were considered one at a time. They were looked at in terms of their cost and then how much benefit we were going to get, and they were less valuable than the ones we invested in. We continue to consider them. You know, we continue to consider ro ro roles for solar and ro roles for uh, capturing waste gas from fields and the like. Uh, geothermal is being considered actively as we think about new construction projects on the North Campus. So all that thinking was valuable, it just hasn't been done as yet, and we work our way through things in a prioritized way. I cannot make a commitment in advance to say that I will do everything that this uh, Commission on Carbon Neutrality suggests, but uh, Steve Forrest had a good way to put it. He said that you wanted to make recommendations that were so compelling that we had, had to, how did you put it, Steve? You had a clever way to put it. You know, that essentially, we have to do it. And I would welcome a set of recommendations that struck all the right balances and got us to neutrality absolutely as fast as humanly possible while may still maintaining the, the essence of the university and our overall value system. So uh, it's, it's a commission and it makes recommendations. I, I, I would be giving away the authority of the president and the regents to tell the commission, tell us what to do and we'll do everything but I want them to tell us what they think we should do, and then we'll discuss it and implement the things we can and get to the goals that we share as quickly as possible. Does that sort of make sense? Um, that's the best I can do. And go backwards a little bit so I can get at the earlier questions. Yeah, um, I appreciate your answer. I'm looking for a specific procedural or oh. structural change that you can make to ensure that the recommendations so I think are followed. Transparency is really important on this. So. You know, once we have a set of recommendations and the things we accept to do, you know, we'll find ways to measure what needs to be measured and there'll be dates and a timeline and we'll make all the data public. So you'll see how successful we are. Uh, I hope we're 100% successful. I think, you know, we might end up uh, being too ambitious and not get to where we want to go, but we... Uh, we'll lay down goals, uh, a pathway how to get there, and make the data available, and the proof will be if we get there, and you'll have the information uh, that you need to hold us to account, is the best I can say. Okay, and could you also address my first question about the trespass citations and being banned from campus? Yeah, I uh, do not have information saying that people have been banned from campus. Uh, certainly not our students. It, it could. No, no, thank you. Are you a student here? Yeah. And you were banned from campus. From Fleming. From the Fleming Building. Okay. And 
others, I don't know the details. Others were why. banned from all of U of M's campus for a year. So Michigan students were banned from the U of M campus? They weren't students at the University okay. of Michigan, but gotcha. they were young people who were underage. Yeah, I don't know the details of the behaviors that led to that. I just don't know. And prospective students. Yeah, I, I don't know the details of the behavior that led to that. The vast majority of people uh, that rallied on the Diag and that came to the building and filtered through and you know, protested for many, many, many hours uh, went home when they were done. Uh, okay, thank you. All right, so we have another comment question. Um, it has a little bit of a comment at the beginning as well. So you have stated your opposition to binding a future U of M president to a science-based state for carbon neutrality. Why are you more concerned about protecting an unknown future U of M president from having to follow through an ambitious climate action on am ambitious climate action than protecting the futures of the nearly 45,000 students on campus now? Do you believe it's because the 2025 sustainability goals left by your predecessor have been a burden? Uh, so I will not hesitate to make a commitment that will play out after I'm gone. I'm not, I, I, it would be a great thing if I was still here when we hit neutrality. Uh, I don't anticipate it, but you know, maybe we'll be able to do even better and work even faster than we think or that you're asking for. Uh, I think what I am loath to do is to have no idea how to get there and then encumber a successor. This, when the university makes a commitment, it has to live up to the commitment. And 100% carbon neutrality um, depending upon how we choose to define it and the different scopes that we have in play, um, that's a big goal. And it's the right goal, <coughs> but without doing the thinking in advance of how to get ourselves on a trajectory, how to get there, um, it just wouldn't seem appropriate to me, or ethical almost, to tell a successor who's unknown and a date that's unknown that they have to do something that we don't know how to do and don't have a pathway plotted out to get there. So that's what I meant uh, by those comments of saying that I don't want to have a successor burdened by this. Um, it's not to protect the successor, it's to protect the integrity of the university. And I think if we're all patient with each other, give each other our best advice and our, our goodwill, we will be able to come up with a plan that will get us to neutrality surprisingly soon. But we don't know what that plan is, that's why we're working. Uh, a number of months ago, people were protesting and asking me to make a, a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2050. And that was just a few months ago. You know, now the arguments are being made that we might have a legitimate shot at being carbon neutral by 2030, which would be a fantastic accomplishment. It would be great. So let's spend a little bit of time together getting our experts who are on the commission getting people from the faculty writ broad, the student community writ broad, experts from off the campus, our partners in the rest of the economy in the city of Ann Arbor and around the state to figure out how to do this. And it won't take forever to develop our plan. And as I said, along the way, as good ideas arise or as experiments become obvious that we can do to figure out how to get there, we'll do them. We're not gonna arbitrarily wait for a commission report if there are great ideas on the table that we should be following. Thanks. <coughs> Who's next? I think we have another microphone question. Hi, my name is Noah Weaverdick. I'm one of those students that you arrested so that we could have this talk. Um, uh, as far as good ideas that we should implement, I mean, just off the top of my head, there are three different building standards that were offered up over four years ago that we still haven't switched to and we've spent about a half a billion dollars on construction since then, which unfortunately is going to have to, um, I don't know if the costs for retrofitting those were factored into the cost of the buildings, but anyways, my real question is that uh, the accountability piece is something that I think that is not, you're not quite grasping that we feel is lacking in this, right? So going back to what Liv was talking about in terms of actual structural mechanisms to ensure that this gets continued and it's not just a trust me, we'll implement these because these are long-term expensive, um, but like only if you think short-term uh, sort of processes, right? So uh, again, 
four years ago in this uh, report, the Carbon Neutrality Commission, or sorry, Committee, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Committee, um, suggested that if the CPP, the central power plant, were to uh, have, be expanded to burn fossil fuels, it would tie us to fossil fuels, and that would not be seen as an action of a climate leader, so it would need to have a concrete plan to transition it to alternative fuels, right? Um, in the four years since, nobody has been directed to develop that plan, and that's a failure, right? So you talk about accountability, that's just one of many. So even the ones that we are implementing, the only ones that we are implementing are to reach a date that was set previously. Those ones that we are implementing, we're only half-assing, and we're pick taking out of context. So who's developing this plan to transition this? Now we have to replace this boiler. Now we have to expand this power plant. That's, that's what we're saying, for reliability reasons, for life-saving procedures. But we've had four years to develop plans to figure out how to transition this, which other schools have already done, right? Uh, for how do we heat and cool this campus in an efficient way where we're not running the heating and the air conditioning at the same time in every building all year round, right? And we've talked to the plant operators. That's totally possible. We can do it. They say nobody has told them to actually develop a plan and nobody has given them the resources to do it. It's possible. We just need the mechanisms for somebody to actually maintain pressure to actually make it happen. So my question to you is, why were they not directed to come up with those plans four years ago when the Greenhouse Gas Committee recommended it? And at what point will they get directed to come up with those plans? So I would argue that we are and have, and we're continuing to do what you're talking about. You're saying at a moment in time, when the report was released, everything should have happened simultaneously according to a list. I think working on all these things is a very reasonable expectation. We took the top priorities, the ones that we calculated would get us to this 25% initial commitment with the notion that that's not nearly enough, we have to continue on, and that's what we're doing now. Uh, the uh, question of nobody being instructed to figure out how to make buildings more energy efficient, if, if I'm paraphrasing you the right way, every building project has that built into it, and they all get certified at certain levels, and we're gonna argue whether we're certifying them high enough or not, uh, and the clock is ticking. So I share your sense of anxiousness uh, we're doing many things. Uh, I don't accept the premise that we're behind every university in the country. I think we're working hard and seriously on an enormous problem, and we should be working on the enormous problem together, sharing our best ideas. In terms of accountability, I am open to suggestions. So what would the community look for to have a sense that the ideas that we're coming up with, the time and effort that people who sit on these commissions and committees and scholars and students put into this is having the desired output. And I'm all ears, let's do this. Yeah, so to clarify, the uh, which standards we should implement, the Greenhouse Gas Committee did that already four years ago. So they, they gave the standards, the building standards. That's for just efficiency, building efficiency. We haven't changed those since. Those are still on the same standards they were okay. referring to. Uh, what wanted to happen at that instant and the accountability to sort of ensure that those recommendations got followed up on is that the, the, we look to develop a concrete plan to transition our heating and cooling away from fossil fuels, which again was a recommendation by the experts on this previous committee. So to ensure that the experts on the current committee do not feel like their time is being wasted, I guess we're looking for uh, actual guarantees in a structural manner, such as setting a date ahead of time, like Christiana Figueres, who was just here, architect of the Paris Agreement, suggested, right, that we set that based on the science, we take that as our assumption, and then that actually builds in the mechanism, just like how we decided which recommendations to implement to the Greenhouse Gas Committee, yeah. that that will actually ensure that these current experts, that their recommendations actually do not just get left behind. Yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion, and if the committee wants to work backwards and say, what would it take to get to neutrality by fill in the box date and come 2035. up. 2035. I beg your pardon? 2035 or 2030, 2030 would well, be good. Well, it's 2050 and then we, then we have a little buffer, ago, but scope but, three, you know. You know, make an ambitious, yeah. you know, as a thought exercise that could be real, make an ambitious target, work backwards, and come forward with a plan for how you might do this. 
Uh, and you know, you're right, we have to stick to it and we have to continuously ask if we're doing all of the best things we can do. How do we make sure right. we're doing that? Yeah. Asking those questions, yearly review, publicly well, posted all of like itemized responses. Well, I think it's a very good idea once the commission has done its work that we uh, uh, look at the recommendations that are made, embrace an initial set of them that we can get started on right away, report on them on a regular basis and hold ourselves to account. Okay, I'll be looking Thank to you. see that hold ourselves to account bit and what actually makes us do that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's almost six o'clock, the lines are long. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to exhaust uh, everyone's questions, but you know, please go ahead, ask questions. We'll keep going for a little while longer, uh, but yeah, we'll, eventually this will draw to a close. But do you wanna go to a, a card question? Or Why should we, we go use one the more over here? Okay. And everybody's questions or comments will be, uh, who have put them on cards, and I think if you're at the end of the lines, it'll be hard in the time we have left to reach the front of the line, so, but put them on a card, so make sure the commission hears what you have to say. Um, and President Solicitor. And I promise to go through these cards as well, and you know, hopefully they'll be curated a little, but there's yeah. a fair amount of overlap between the things people are requesting and suggesting, but I would like to see them. Yeah, and this commission, I can tell you, we're all dead serious about it, getting this job done, just as the President and all of you are. Uh, one question over here, we'll try and uh, wrap this up, maybe in... Well, a few uh, more, we can do a few more, but okay. just a few. go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Vedya, you've heard from me before. Um, first, I wanted to kind of acknowledge that you're taking a long time and rambling through your responses and taking up most of the airtime at an event where you said you wanted to hear from students. You're taking like 80 to 90% of the time for yourself. So you're telling me to be more concise. I'm telling you to be more concise, and I'm also telling you to honor the, the people who have stood in line this long and commit to answering their questions. Um, you've run away from me at a town hall before, and I don't want to see that happen again. Um, my question has to do with the fact that your admin's decisions don't, exa don't exactly exist in a vacuum. Uh, as a major respected institution, your decisions inspire others' decisions and beliefs. When you decide to appoint fossil fuel execs to a carbon neutrality commission, you inspire belief in companies responsible for the destruction of our world as it exists today. When you arrest peacefully protesting students, you inspire fear in future students who might otherwise feel better exercising their First Amendment rights and inspire further dismissal of climate change activists. When you're constantly expanding and developing, you're inspiring ignorance of the degrowth necessary to slow climate change and give us slightly more time. And also the sort of inspiration that you work on isn't limited to climate change. Uh, when you allow Ben Shapiro to speak here, you inspire beliefs in, the, in his views that led to a mosque shooting days later. Uh, when you fail to do anything about racist violence outside of a poster campaign that invites more of it, you make white supremacists feel safe to continue exacting that violence. I want to know how you will hold yourself and your administration uh, to account, not just for the harm you've caused and you are currently causing, but also the harm you're inspiring. And I also want to know what you want your legacy to be. Do you want to be forgotten as a president who collected fat paychecks and maintained a destructive status quo as the world burned down around him? Or do you want to be rem remembered as the president who said enough is enough and stood up and created actual change? So my brief answer is thank you. What my legacy will be, it's not about me. It's about the university and our shared future. I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon? Come on, let's keep it civil, everybody. Well, if you pick out one component and give me a moment, I'm happy to respond to a question. Um, so I don't think I cause harm, actually. I may not succeed at preventing harm, uh, but I don't think I'm an agent of harm. Maybe I am. I don't think I am. Uh, I do not think we've made adequate progress on many of the issues that you care about and that I care about, too. Uh, and I think what we owe each other is uh, sincere effort and honesty with each other. And that's what I commit to. Questions? 
Sure. Uh, card reads, uh, Yale documents that internal carbon pricing on campus has been effective. The earlier Greenhouse Gas Committee recommended this step. Will the university consider internal carbon pricing if people who can work on this are available? Uh, so uh, a carbon pricing regime I think is interesting and if the commission brings something forward uh, that makes sense for the campus and can help us get to um, neutrality, um, I would certainly consider it. Okay, um, one more question over here, one more question over here, and another card, and maybe we'll let, then let President Sissel make some closing comments, unless he wants to keep going. <laughs> hey, my name is Chris Keep Karinis. it short if you can. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a student here, a master's student. Um, I, Mark, I could talk to you for an hour just yelling upset, because um, this is such a frustrating situation, and it is for so many students because um, it, there's so much at stake. Um, I, I talked to Secretary Bruce Kishner of the Marshall Islands to really understand this and to really get past the climate nihilism that I've, I'm hearing from you that I previously had about, it's just a drop in the bucket. Nothing I could ever do would really matter. Um, nothing the university could ever do is anything more than a symbolic gesture. Um, but the Marshall Islands, um, he was telling me about his people and how in 50 years um, his country will be underwater and how when his people lose their land, they've lost everything because they're, they're so attached to the land. And when I asked him what he thought about Trump, uh, pulling out of the Paris Accord because it was, it, it seemed like a slap in the face to him. I was really surprised when he told me that um, it's not really Donald Trump that determines climate action. It's the people, it's the universities, it's the states, and it's even people just taking actions in the household. So um, it made me realize that um, even if I think you know these actions don't mean anything, it means a lot to Secretary Bruce Kishner. It means a lot to the people of the Marshall Islands, um, and the University of Michigan has a GDP 60 times the size of the Marshall Islands, and our carbon footprint is bigger than that of the Marshall Islands. So saying that it doesn't matter is, is really saying like these people don't matter. And I, I think that you would agree that these people do matter. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my, my question though is about di is divestment. Christiana Figueres made a really good point about how financially bad the investment in fossil fuels was, and she made a really strong point about that. I mean, there's obviously we should consider the people of the Marshall Islands when making these choices, but also isn't it a bad investment to be invested in a dying industry? Yeah, so uh, the first point you made, uh, actually that's not what I said. I didn't say what you do doesn't matter. What I said is if we're the only institution around the world or in this region that achieve carbon neutrality, we actually aren't big enough to save the Marshall Islands. That doesn't mean that collective action doesn't happen here and has to happen here, but it also has to happen at lots of other places. So one of, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons for the approach we've taken is to develop solutions that aren't just University of Michigan solutions so that we can have a bigger impact than our size, if, if that makes sense to you. And then, I'm sorry, tell me the last part of your question again. Aren't, aren't fossil fuel investments a bad investment? Why, yeah, why would we? We wouldn't. Make we, wouldn't money? we wouldn't make investments. That's the logical fallacy of what this spectacular leader, Ms. Figueres, uh, had to say, is we wouldn't make them if they were bad investments. Uh, we're making them not in huge amounts uh, because they're part of a diverse portfolio of investments. Yeah. Couldn't hear a thing. It's a, it's a billion dollars that we have invested in it, which is um, bigger than. A well, you must have insight GDPs that I don't, the but there's a, there are significant uh, investments in companies that certainly uh, uh, use and develop fossil fuels in the endowment, undeniably. Yes. Yeah. But, but uh, don't you think that we should divest, question, or? given okay. these, and given what Christiana Figueroa said, and given all these things, don't you think that maybe it's a good idea to divest? Um, and I, also, I will say we've divested from the tobacco industry and apartheid. Um, in South Africa before, Correct. so it's been done two yeah, times. Been, it has been done before. <laughs> and the extent to which they're bad investments, the incentives that are in the uh, management of the endowment will get out of bad investments and get into good ones. Yeah, let's move on to the next question, yeah. please. I'm, uh, I'm Matt, I'm a junior in LSA. Uh, yeah, so basically this entire thing has been you asking people for help 
uh, with this problem, and I think we all agree that this is something that a lot of people have opinions on and that uh, we have a voice in and we have a say. It's not just you championing this, but there are many people that are out there are willing to help, especially universities, because you've been saying that not all universities are the same and that we can't learn a specific lesson from this place uh, and apply it here directly, but there are many coalitions that you are not a part of looking at the University Climate Change Coalition and the American College and University President's Climate Leadership Network that are there and are willing to help. And as someone who pays this university a lot of money, it makes me very, very upset that you're not part of this. Uh, so I just want to know what could possibly be your justification for not taking the help that's out there. Yeah, I'm willing and happy. I'm willing and happy to get help wherever it comes from. We, we get very large numbers of requests to put the university's name on organizations all over the place. Uh, if there are organizations that have similar goals and values that can provide value to us as we work on the things we care about and we can uh, reciprocally provide value to the larger group, uh, we'll consider these for sure. They have been open invitations for a very long time and I could I don't care at all about rivalries, but OSU is a part of both. Uh, and they are easily making way larger strides than we are. So, thank you. You've been the highest per capita conducted in the Big Ten Conference. Per student. Where can I do a uh, Another comment question real quick. Um, if U of M is not going to divest from fossil fuels, what will we do as an institution to use our shareholder investor power in these companies surrounding carbon neutrality and sustainability? Yeah. So the nature of how the endowment gets invested um, doesn't give it lots of shareholder power because we don't buy lots of stock. We also don't buy, we buy almost no individual stock. So what the endowment does is it gets invested in investment managers that have funds that invest in different sectors. So we don't have the direct influence that comes from making one stock at a time investment decisions. Yeah, I've got, I can, uh, can I do two more? Yeah, you can do two more. Why don't we do one over here and one over here, and then wrap her up. Hi, uh, I'm Drew Tatke. I'm a sophomore in the College of Engineering. Um, so my question is, uh, does it concern you that students feel the need to sacrifice their education because you have not, take, not taken the most basic steps to ensure that this gets done beyond vague statements and forming commission that has no implementation guarantees? A little example of that, I've spent uh, up somewhere around 50 hours in your office reading our demands over and over again. I know countless people have done it too, and uh, I really applaud all their efforts. Um, Young people worldwide are terrified of a future in which warming uh, greater than two degrees Celsius uh, can affect our homes and our lives um, with drought, wildfires, frequent intense natural disasters, and more. Some recent examples of that, the uh, California wildfires just last week, or I think last week, uh, the flooding of the Missouri, uh, flooding the Missouri River, uh, leaving at least 30 dead, count, uh, countless um, towns being flooded, people losing their homes. Um, so many students have been, and many students have also been seeking counseling due to fear of a future dictated by older generations, politicians, and institutions such as this one. Um, what do you have to say to these students to whom you're, like, you're accountable? Yeah, I'd say that the problems are real and it's really scary and you know that already. And that as an organization and as individuals, uh, we have to be committed to taking this problem as seriously as anything that we do. And I think that we are. And we may disagree on that, but we're working to head in the direction uh, that we all agree we need to end up as quickly as we can. I also think it's not entirely fair to ignore the work that's already been done as in the last years leading up to this 25% above a baseline from 2006 in a campus that's grown a lot. So it's not trivial what we've done, and there's a lot more work to be done. Um, yeah, I think getting upset and angry about it does make sense. It deserves that level of anger, and it's, it's scary. Uh, but then after that period's <coughs> over, I think we need to work together in figuring out how to get solutions. It's not like we can still talk and find solutions while we are angry uh, yeah. and while we are confused yeah. and sad and terrified. 
Um, but we, we're just looking for real concrete answers. And that's, that will dispel this fear. And we haven't heard that. Was that an answer? The answer is I think I've said this same set of things you know, numerous times. You know, we've done a number of things that get us to 25% several years earlier than the initial goal. We're continuously examining what we're doing today and we're setting up a bunch, an inclusive bunch of, of smart people with various perspectives to advise us how to go further and further with the ultimate goal of neutrality. We just have to get it done. One last question over here. Um, my name is Henry Bites, and I'm a citizen of Ann Arbor. <laughs> Thank you. My concern is that fossil fuels have a limited timeline. Renewables are incredibly expensive and very inefficient and have a life cycle cost that is absolutely ridiculous. Why doesn't the university, which has this great engineering school, undertake to make a molten salt reactor. A molten salt reactor has none of the nuclear problems that Helen Caldicott worries about and could easily provide enough electricity for everything in Ann Arbor and on the campus. Yeah, so you're beyond my expertise, although I've heard the term molten salt reactor. I couldn't describe to you what it is. But you know, that's even beyond the scope. I, I think we should be doing research and development in areas that will help us achieve the goals, not just here, but broadly and globally. Um, the thing that you said, which I don't think is quite true, is that the sources of renewables that are currently available are becoming increasingly economic. So solar is becoming less expensive, wind is becoming less expensive, and as that happens and they become more competitive with fossil fuels, the economy is going to drive us towards renewables, which is a good thing. Actually, it isn't a good thing. If you see, we had a physics lecture in 2011 from Dr. Frank Hsu, who compared the costs of all these various technologies. And no matter what we do, and no matter how little renewables will cost, they will never meet our needs. On the other hand, Thorium, which is used in molten salt reactors, is readily available at a ridiculously low price, and I urge everybody to go and watch the 14-minute YouTube presentation by Salim Zwein, Z-W-E-I-N. In 14 minutes, he will convince you that molten salt reactors are the answer. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Well, the, the, uh, of course, there's always room for one more, but n n not 10 more. Well, there are a lot of folks the, here, and we have to be fair. A whole bunch of people that have been standing here for 40 minutes is, is the challenge. And we can do this again. This doesn't have to be the only time, and we're not going to make our way through everybody's best ideas. And then there'll be incremental progress we can talk about in the future as well. So. Uh, well, but what about the other 15 people? Oh, I'll tell you what then, everybody else sit down and this gentleman can ask the last question. If there's a consensus to that. Please. Yes, uh, my, my name is Tom Bald. I'm a former manager of the Biomedical Engineering Department at the University Hospitals. And I'm here to comment about the gas fire generator. I think there's a time factor here that has maybe been overlooked. The decision to upgrade that central power plant was made years ago, but the analysis of the impacts of climate change have drastically changed recently, as reflected in the UN uh, 2018 IPCC report and even the federal government's report. Um, I think the university should take action now to fulfill its promise of being a top academic climate change leader and abandon this fossil fuel plant and instead devote the resources to renewable energy. Thank you, and thanks to the students and faculty and staff that yielded their time, so thanks very much. Um, 
uh, can I just wrap things yeah, up? Yeah, I think it'd be great for you to wrap it up, but just remember everyone that we are going to, the commission I think is very committed to having more conversations of all sorts, because this is not gonna be solved by just a small group. We're all gonna have to work together and we're gonna have to hold each other accountable. So I wanna just thank the president and appreciate your uh, closing remarks. Sure, yeah, I, I don't really have much to add other than another thank you, because all the things that were said today were important things. They're all things worth arguing about. Um, I don't think uh, I deserve to be trusted on spec. I think we ha all have to live up to the commitments that we make. Um, the pitch that I'll make is that we have to do this together. Each of us has to identify a role. Uh, I have a, one role, it's a very important role here, but each of you have individually and collectively uh, important roles to play in our ultimate success as well. Uh, I ask everybody, particularly the students, to make sure you're registered to vote. That's an important way we can you know, play a role uh, in collective action around these challenges. Uh, we'll do more events like this. The commission will keep folks up to date on what's happening. Good ideas that emerge that people uh, say are no-brainers. If they're things that we really can do, then they make sense to do. We're not going to wait for a, a final report. We're going to go ahead and do it. If there are experiments we can do to figure out what the best thing is to do, we have some resources put aside to do experimentation on how we can run our campus uh, in as efficient and as carbon neutral a way as possible. Uh, thanks, thanks for the forbearance of, of you know, res respectfully answering and listening to answers, some of which that you didn't like, but I really do appreciate you being willing to listen and, and listen to my perspective. And I certainly appreciate all of yours, uh, as well as the uh, members of the uh, commission and, and Dean Overpeck uh, for helping moderate as well. So thank you all very much. We'll talk again.